HDR, high dynamic range. For years, it's been touted as the next big thing for TV, film, and everything in between. But despite all the hype and all the brilliant tech demos at your local Best Buy, not many people understand what HDR actually is and how it works on a technical level. So in this video, I'm going to be explaining everything you need to know about HDR, how it works, and how it can benefit your content creation and content consumption experience. To start, let's clarify what kind of HDR we're actually talking about. The thing is, the phrase high dynamic range can refer to many different technologies and concepts. So many, in fact, that it's become a major point of confusion when trying to have a discussion about it. The kind of HDR we're talking about today is the kind you'll see advertised on TVs, streaming services, and 4K Blu-ray discs. It's the kind that's been promised to deliver rich contrast and vibrant colors to your favorite movies and shows. This is not the same thing as the HDR mode on your smartphone's camera app, nor is it the same as the dynamic range spec listed in the descriptions of many cameras. These concepts are related, but they're different technologies. The HDR we're talking about today incorporates three main concepts. It increases the dynamic range of the video container, widens the color gamut for more vibrant and saturated colors, and increases the bit depth for reduced banding and visual artifacts. Now, if you'd like some additional context around some of the topics we'll be discussing, I'll link some of my previous videos in the description down below for you to watch. And with that out of the way, let's explain everything you need to know about HDR. This shot looks terrible, but why does it look terrible? Well. I'm sitting in shadow, and you can hardly make out any detail on my face or the things around me. And meanwhile, the background behind me is almost completely blown out. Now, I can increase the exposure to reveal some more detail in the foreground, but then the background just becomes completely white. I could reduce the exposure to bring out detail in the background, but then the foreground just dips into shadow. So there's no way to properly expose this image as is because I don't have enough dynamic range to capture everything at once. So let's talk about what causes this issue and some of the common things that are done to mitigate it. The fundamental problem is that the SDR image container only gives us a range of zero to 100 to store luminance values. Zero is pure black, 100 is pure white, and everything in between. But the issue is anything below zero will be clipped off to be pure black and anything above 100 is also illegal and will be clipped off to pure white. Once this clipping occurs, it's impossible to retain any detail. So we want to keep as much of our image as possible between that 0 to 100 range. Doing the math, we can find that this gives us about 6.5 stops of dynamic range, which might not sound too bad until you realize that the human eye can perceive upwards of 20 stops of dynamic range. While our eyes might be able to perceive huge contrast between light and shadow, we can't store that into a video file. However, there is a way around this. We can use gamma correction to curve our brightness values and squeeze a wider range into the SDR container. More extreme curves like log are particularly good at this, and they allow us to capture this huge range of luminance values without any clipping. But you'll notice that even though we've gained dynamic range, we've lost tonality. If we look at how this log curve compares to a more standard one, we can see that while it does retain more information in the highlights and shadows, it also compresses out all this tonality and detail that we have in the non-log version. So to demonstrate what this does to our image, let's look at this as an example. Let's pretend that these three waves here represent the shadows, midtones, and highlights of the image. Now, I can mimic changing the exposure by shifting these up and down relative to my 0 to 100 scale here. But you'll note that if I bring the highlights within range, now my shadows are clipping. And if I bring the shadows within range, now the highlights are clipping again. There's just too much difference in luminance between the shadows and the highlights to keep everything within range at the same time. 
So what I do is I use a log gamma curve to compress the image down, like this. And you'll see that now everything fits within zero to 100. But there's no longer as much difference in brightness between the midtones and the highlights. There's no clipping going on, but there's not as much contrast as there should be. Now, I can color correct this to bring some of that contrast back, but now the highlights are clipping a little again. And I can color correct it a little more, but there's, there's just no way to fit everything in with accurate contrast and no clipping at the same time. It's a zero sum game, and this is the challenge with correcting log. If you want to squeeze the entire dynamic range in, you have to compress something. And if you want accurate contrast all around the image, then there has to be some clipping. So you have to make sacrifices to fit everything within the SDR container. Going back to our earlier example, we can see this in action. I have to pick and choose which parts of the image I want to retain accurately and which parts I'm willing to compress down, depending on the aesthetic I'm trying to convey. But wouldn't it be great if we could have it all? Have both accurate contrast and high dynamic range? This is where HDR video comes into play. The most common form of HDR video works by increasing our maximum luminance from 100 to 1000 or more. Now, with this much larger container, we can fit our entire image into the container without any clipping or compression. The HDR specifications require that our monitors get brighter, too. So we can now display both deep shadows and brilliant highlights in the same image at the same time without any clipping or compression. So our sunset scene now looks much closer to how it would in person because there's an accurate difference between the shadows and highlights. However, there is one more thing to note about HDR video. The way our monitors respond to instructions differently in HDR versus SDR. According to the SDR specifications, the maximum possible luminance, 100, should correspond to 100 nits coming out of our monitor. However, the thing is, nobody actually follows this part of the spec. 100 nits really isn't all that bright, especially when you consider that brilliant highlights are often compressed down to just 100 nits through the process we described before. So instead, our displays cheat. When they're told to display 100 nits, they actually display whatever their maximum brightness is, be it 200, 300, or 500 nits. Then they scale all the other brightness values accordingly. This doesn't actually increase our dynamic range, it just makes the image brighter. This is all well and good, but it becomes a problem when values like 500 nits are actually legal within the video container. Most versions of HDR video have a scale from 0 to 1000, meaning not only do monitors have to get brighter than usual, they also have to adjust how they interpret commands from the computer. If they displayed 100 nits as, say, 300 nits like they do in SDR, then everything above 100 nits would look way too bright. So in HDR, when a monitor is told to display 100 nits, it actually does what it's told and displays 100 nits. What this means is that our images have to be color graded differently in HDR. An image that looks fine in SDR will suddenly look dark and flat in HDR, so it'll need to be expanded back out to fill the container properly. And it's not as simple as just scaling the luminance values to fill the new container either. It's possible that you want your highlights to be brighter than 100 nits, but not quite 1000 nits. So there's no quick and easy way to convert an SDR image into HDR, at least not well it takes time and skill to do. This is actually a big problem because it means we can't just automatically upconvert SDR to HDR or downconvert HDR to SDR. We'll need to define a complex mathematical transform that defines exactly how the SDR values should be mapped onto the HDR container and vice versa. And this transform might be different depending on the aesthetic choices of the colorist. But when HDR is done well, it can produce a much more vibrant and true-to-life image that can enhance the viewing experience compared to the old SDR standard.
So as I've discussed before, the color space of a digital video defines what range of physical colors can be accurately represented within the video container. Now, SDR video uses the Rec. 709 color space, which is adequate for most purposes, but it doesn't cover every color the human eye can perceive. So there's an upper limit on how saturated a color can be within the Rec. 709 space. HDR widens our color gamut to the much wider Rec. 2020 color space, which allows us to store much more vibrant and saturated colors without any clipping. So by using HDR, we can store much more true to life values because we don't have to reduce the saturation as much as we do in Rec. 709. The last major thing that HDR does to improve the quality of our image is it increases the bit depth. The bit depth refers to how many digital bits are used to encode each color of the image. The more bits we use, the more subtle variations between colors we can store. Now when you don't have enough bit depth, you can end up with this ugly color banding because you don't have enough bits to store the differences between one color and the next. So SDR video uses eight bits per channel, which allows for up to 16.7 million possible colors. And this is enough for most situations, but it can still end up with some amount of color banding, particularly in the shadows. So HDR video increases the bit depth to 10 bits per channel or more, which allows for up to 1.07 billion possible colors. Every bit you add increases the maximum bit depth by a factor of eight. But in order to get a good 10 bit per channel image, you'll need to capture at least 10 bits in the first place. Once you crush something down to eight bits per channel, there's no way to recover that lost granularity. Now, most consumer cameras record with eight bits per channel. So you'll need to make sure you have a camera that can record a minimum of 10 bits per channel of color depth. So now that you understand what HDR is and what it can do for your viewing experience, what do you actually need to do to watch HDR content? Well, unfortunately, you're probably gonna need a new TV. HDR not only changes the way our images are encoded, but it also has additional hardware requirements that your display will need to meet in order to display true HDR content. Those requirements are as follows. One, have a maximum brightness of around 1,000 nits. Most displays have a peak brightness between 200 and 500 nits, so your pixels are gonna need a brightness boost in order to accurately display those gorgeous highlights. Two, either employ OLED technology or backlight dimming. Even if your display can hit 1,000 nits of brightness, that doesn't do you much good if it can't show you deep blacks at the same time. This is particularly problematic with LCD panels since increasing the brightness of the backlight also increases the brightness of what is supposed to be black. LCDs can get around this by using backlight dimming zones, essentially dimming different regions of the display to allow for bright highlights and deep shadows at the same time. The more dimming zones your display has, the more accurate your contrast will be. Another approach is to use an OLED panel. OLEDs don't have a backlight and their pixels are self-illuminating. So they have no problem displaying true black right next to the brightest white. But OLEDs have their own set of problems, a bit too technical to get into right now. The point is a standard LCD panel isn't gonna cut it if you're gonna watch HDR content. Three, your display will need to support a wide color gamut. As stated before, HDR uses the Rec. 2020 color space, which is much wider than the Rec. 709 we're used to. This means our displays will need to be built and calibrated to be able to display much more vibrant colors. Four, support 10 bits per channel or more. Most displays can only represent up to eight bits per channel of precision. So we'll need to build our display to be able to handle the extra bit depth. Now that you know what's required for an HDR display, forget it because nobody actually adheres to these specifications. 
The problem is that all a display has to do to advertise itself as HDR is to be able to decode an HDR signal sent to it. What this leads to is many SDR displays that can advertise themselves as HDR because they just take an HDR signal and then down convert it to work on their SDR hardware. So you're not really getting the HDR experience. And this can be a big problem because you don't know whether your display is giving you real HDR or just a cheap imitation of it. Many displays very much do meet those requirements, but they'll have to compete with much cheaper displays that can also advertise HDR on the box. So in order to know which you're getting, you'll have to do some research into your particular display and figure out which of the requirements it does and doesn't meet. And even once you do have an HDR display, you'll need some HDR content to watch on it. Once again, it's not as simple as just upconverting SDR to HDR. You can do it, but it won't really look as good. So for true HDR, your best bets are streaming services that advertise their originals as HDR and 4K Blu-ray discs that require all movies on them to have HDR encoding. So what if you're not just a content consumer, but you're a content producer as well? Well, while the vast majority of projects will not need to be produced in HDR for the foreseeable future, it can still be good to know how the process works. The first thing you're going to need to do is to capture your footage in HDR. For this, you're going to need a camera setup that can record the necessary dynamic range, color gamut, and bit depth. Now, this is most often done either using a log curve to squeeze an HDR signal into an SDR file, like we discussed before, or by using RAW, which can be interpreted as either HDR or SDR. Now, obviously this isn't something that your average consumer DSLR can handle. While it is theoretically possible to convert just about any video to HDR, the results won't be as striking. For professional results, you'll need to use professional equipment. Now that you've captured your footage, you'll need to color grade it in HDR. The most common software used to do this is DaVinci Resolve, which can be used for professional color grading in both SDR and HDR. This won't be an in-depth HDR mastering tutorial, but I'll go over the basics. You'll need to set your color science to HDR, and then use color management to expand your log SDR image into a non-log HDR image. If you've done it right, your scopes should show the luminance values from 0 to 1000, not just 0 to 100. Now, you could just export this as is, but you'll probably want to do some creative color grading to make your image look as good as possible. For this, you'll need a professional quality HDR monitor, so you know what you're looking at. While you could theoretically use an SDR display, it won't be able to accurately emulate the HDR experience, so you'll probably end up with inferior results. Once you have your image the way you like it, you'll encode the image using an HDR container and get it ready to deliver to your platform of choice. Because of the sheer cost of the equipment needed for an HDR workflow, it's no surprise that pretty much the only ones actually making stuff in HDR are the big studios. While YouTube technically does support HDR, it's probably going to be a while before we see this process becoming commonplace for us mere mortals. So that's a general explanation of what HDR is and what it might mean for the future of digital video. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to let me know in the comment section down below and get subscribed to my channel if you want to see more content like this. Anyway, my name is Cayman Crocker, signing off.